You can take this pencil with you. Don't knock it off. So, well, good morning again, everyone. So it's great to see you. Uh, wonderful, wonderful worship time this morning. Thank you, worship team, for all that you do. And um, we uh, we got a jam-packed Sunday today. I most some of us do anyway. So uh, I'm grateful that all of you are here, and uh, trust that. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, that uh, you'll be blessed. So uh, let me pray for uh, our uh, balance of our worship time. Father, we thank you again for these uh, songs of praise and, and adoration and the glory uh, and uh, you know, one day we look forward to that day when we'll sing them in your presence. And so, Father, as we... Uh, continue to uh, navigate through our worship, time of worship and, and teaching today, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, continue to guide our thoughts and our, uh, our minds uh, would be focused on, again, uh, the bread of life, which we will, uh, the, the instruction book that you give us on how to live our lives. So be with us during this time. I pray that you'd use me, Lord and that your Holy Spirit would be uh, the teacher and I would be the instrument. In Jesus' name, amen. On September the 12th, 1905, approximately 100 people met in a loft over Peck's Restaurant at 140 Fulton Street in Lower Manhattan. The purpose of the meeting was to strategize the overthrow of the Christian world view that still pervaded much of American culture and to replace it with ideas of then rather a rather unknown writer by the name of Karl Marx. They called the organization they formed the, that day the Intercollegiate Socialist Society. The godfather of the organization was a 27-year-old author by the name of Upton Sinclair. The first president chosen was the author Jack London, age 29. Also present was Clarence Darrow, the attorney. Now, for many of you, those names probably don't mean anything. But for some of us, uh, maybe uh, for you young, young folks, to your parents, and for, for certainly those of us who are... Uh, more or less, uh, a little more mature. Uh, these names mean a lot, as will the ones that I'll continue to read here. Uh, the strategy of the organization was to infiltrate their ideas into academia by organizing chapters in as many colleges and universities as possible. And organized they did. Walter Lippmann, later author and director of the Council on Foreign Relations, was the president of the Harvard chapter. Walter Ruther, the future president of the United Auto Workers, headed the Wayne State chapter, and Eugene Debs, who went on to become the five-time socialist candidate for president, was the leader at Columbia University. The society grew. The first annual convention was held in 1910, and by 1917, they were active on 61 campuses and a dozen graduate schools. Other early activists included W.E.B. DuVos, uh, who would become an official of the NAACP, and later a Communist Party member, and Victor Berger of Wisconsin, who became the first socialist elected to Congress. In 1921, the Intercollegiate Socialist Society took its next organizational step, changing its name to the League for Industrial Democracy. Its purpose was education for a new social order based on production for use and not for profit. Sounds like socialism to me. Uh, Norman Thomas, another perennial socialist candidate for president, was the leader behind the scenes. The re renamed organization's first president was Robert Lovett, editor of the New Republic, and the field secretary was Paul Blanchard, who later became an author. The college chapters of the Intercollegiate so Socialist Society now became the Student League for Industrial Democracy. As members graduated from college, some entered the pulpit, others the classroom, some wrote textbooks, while others entered the labor movement and both political parties. When the New Deal began in 1933, 
they were prepared. At the time, the league had only 5,652 members, but they were in positions of leadership everywhere. By 1941, John Dewey, who many of you will remember that name, anybody in education remembers that name, the founder of Progressive Education and the league vice president in the 1930s was its honorary president. And Ron, Ronhold Nabor, the theologian, its treasurer. Dewey had already organized the Progressive Education uh, and the American Association of University Professors. So the, the, the Progressive, Progressive Education Association is now the, is the National Education Association. Go figure. Um, the League for Industrial Democracy was so successful that those who held membership in the movement or were cooperating with it could have been a list of who's who in America. Robert N. Baldwin, uh, N. Baldwin, who was the founder of the American Civil Liberties Unit, Union, Charles Beard, the historian, Carol Binder, editor of the Minneapolis Tribune, Helen Gahan Douglas, the congresswoman who was defeated by Richard Nixon for the U.S. Senate, Felix Frankfurter, Supreme Court Justice, Sidney Hook, the educational social philosopher, Edna St. Vincent Millay, the poet, Henry Morgenthau, Jr., one of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt's most trusted economic advisors, advisors, Walter and Victor Ruther, United Auto Workers, Will Rogers, the humorous, Franklin Roosevelt, Jr., the president's son, and Arthur Schlesinger, the historian. The ob obscure loft in Manhattan where they organized has long been forgotten. But what began that night permeates America's institutions and culture, having replaced the Bible-based values of the 19th century with a liberal, liberalism based in Marxism. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not conspiracy theory. This is a fact. I, I went and did fact-checking on this myself. That doesn't make me without error, but I'm telling you, it is a factual summary of Satan's plan to undermine the biblical values and foundations upon which our country was established and that had been the strength of the, of the church and families even before America was born 250 years ago. The strategy to infiltrate and to reshape the whole of American thought and morality via academic and educational indoctrination media influence and compromising the underpinnings of the church and religious institutions was certainly masterful. We see its impact as we view the values once held dear by financial, economic, industrial, political sectors of our society that have become corrupted as generational changes in leadership of major corporations, banks, government, and industry have occurred. Its effectiveness has been especially evident in recent years as we witnessed the decline of moral and, and ethical values, uh, the rewriting of history, the, the capture and indoctrination of our educational system and its institutional institutions of higher learning, and the rise of anti-Semitism and the redistribution of wealth, and, and the list goes on and on and on. The Puritan pastor and, and writer Thomas Watson once said, the devil is always trying to blow out the light of Scripture one way or another. And I submit to you as evidence, the church in pursuit of love and peace among all people, with and for all, has been a compliant participant in this movement away from the Judeo-Christian values and toward liberalism and socialism, exactly what happened in Germany in the 1930s. And we are in our lifetime are the witnesses. And in some cases, we're the facilitators of this evil plan that Satan has to destroy the church. And this is further evidence, in my opinion, by the erosion of the mission given to the church by Jesus in Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always 
to the end of the age. Some of you may re recall a message that I preached back in uh, uh, May, uh, the Sunday after Mother's Day, and, uh, entitled uh, Living in a Crooked and Perverse Generation. Now, in that message, I shared a brief excerpt from uh, a book that was written by a gentleman by the name of uh, Eric Metaxas. And in the preamble to the, his book, Letter to the American Church, he, he wrote the following, and I won't read the whole thing, but I'll share a portion of it with you. I am convinced the American church is at an impossibly, impossibly almost unbearably important inflection point. The parallels to where the German church was in the 1930s is unavoidable and grim. The parallels to, uh, excuse me, so the only question is whether we might understand those parallels and thereby avoid the fatal mistakes the German church made during that time and their superlatively catastrophic results. If we do not, he goes on, I am convinced we will reap a whirlwind greater even than the one they did. It is for good or ill that America plays an inescapable central role in the world. The extent to which the, that central role has been used for good and for God's purposes has had everything to do with our churches or with the American church as he calls her. If America is in except, any way exceptional, it has nothing to do with the blood that runs through American veins and has everything to do with the blood shed for us on Calvary. And the extent to which we have acknowledged this and the part that the church in America has played in, in encouraging, creating, and sustaining a culture of liberty. So the church has been a vital part of who America is. This statement by Metaxas became even more relevant and real to me uh, recently. Uh, if uh, we have a Jewish friend, uh, a couple of Jewish friends that live in, uh, in Jerusalem, and um, I received a text message from one of them uh, on October the 31st. This is 24 days after Israel was attacked by Hamas. Uh, the Hamas terrorist on October the 7th. And here's what that message said. As a religious Jew, and he's Orthodox uh, Jew, I personally believe that America always was a Christian country. And even if the Constitution doesn't say so, and uh, excuse me, parenthetically, if the, even if the Constitution doesn't say so, and only has a future if it is a Christian country. The alternative is chaos. And that would be a disaster for the entire world. It isn't a popular, it isn't a popular opinion internationally, but America must lead the world. His words, not mine. And it's amazing that this gentleman can see that, and he represents many countries in this world who see that and look to the United States to be the moral leader of the world as well as the economic and leader and humanitarian leader of the world. And if, if, if you're following the, uh, the uh, uh, Israeli-Hamas war or even the Ukraine war, uh, whatever else uh, that happens to be the current crisis, um, Metaxas's perspective and my friend's perspective is, is very telling. And um, very telling. Uh, it's, it's my personal opinion that, that uh, without God's direct intervention, America is a, a one generation, at best two generations away from no longer being considered a Christian nation and no longer being the leader of the free world. Unless the church returns to its foundational values, that is the inspired word of God, and gets serious about the mission that was given to us by Jesus in Matthew 28. <clears throat> and then just, just not to be repetitive, but to be repetitive, that mission is to go and make disciples. 
as in brief, it's go and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So as I stand here before you today, and I've said this previously, and, I, and again, I may sound to be, be, be sound a bit repetitive, and I apologize for that. But as uh, my friend stated, uh, in, uh, we have to. The, America's future is by by being the Christian country, by being a Christian country, by Christ being the predominant and the biblical worldview, as it were, being a predominant part of our lives. And so the, we must reprogram, our, reprogram ourselves to focus on the foundations of our faith and the mission that Jesus has called us to do. Now, um, before I continue, let, I'm going to assure everybody that this is not a political message, okay? Uh, what I'm advocating is that get, is getting serious about our individual mission as believers in Jesus Christ and the mission of the church. And um, my purpose today is to draw our attention to, A, the importance of having a biblical worldview. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a moment. And, and to explore what a biblical worldview looks like. And, and then uh, thirdly, what New Hanover Church can do or is doing uh, or has planned and to... Um, facilitate and enhance one's existing worldview so that it's more biblically aligned. And fourth, what you individually can do to educate yourselves uh, and solidify your foundational beliefs in the Word of God. And um, so as, uh, as is our custom, we let the Word of God guide us where we want to go, and we're going to do that today too. Um, but first, before we get to the scripture for the day, I want to just uh, do a little bit of a, an educational uh, overview here about worldviews. Uh, so what is a biblical worldview, uh, or what is a worldview for that matter? Now, simply stated, a world, uh, everyone has a, a set of fundamental beliefs that, and convictions that, that shape the way you live your life. And this set of beliefs is your worldview. And a worldview that's shaped by the tenets of the Bible is a biblical worldview. That's the short, in short, that's what worldview and biblical worldview are. Now, um, the, the, the funnel, your fundamental belief system or conventions that formulate a worldview center around life's most important questions. Uh, like the, such as the origin and purpose of life or the existence of evil or, or the nature of hope, what happens after death. Uh, but it's, but it, it, it's, it really, uh, worldview answers these questions here, these four questions, and it's why are we here? Why are we here? Why are we put on this earth to exist? And what has gone wrong with the world? And is there any hope for the world? And how does it all end? At the end of the day, how does it end? Now, there are five predominant worldviews uh, and or hybrids of those worldviews. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And there's a sixth one that, uh, that has emerged uh, in the U.S. in recent years. Now, I'm going to quickly go, walk through these. Um, and the, the, the six, the five traditional ones are biblical, the worldview, or uh, Judeo-Christian as it's referred to as well. Islam, pantheism, naturalism, postmodernism. And then the sixth one that has recently emerged is syncretism. And um, essentially uh, what separates these is uh, biblical, of course, is belief in God and of, and of the Bible and his word is truth. Islam is, uh, again, is a monotheistic uh, uh, worldview uh, or religion, rather. Uh, and the, those people are followers of Muhammad and, and, and the, uh, primarily the Koran. Um, and that's the tenets that they uh, go by. Uh, in pantheism, everybody, everything's God. All is God. They revere the universe. Uh, and everybody's opinion is, 
moral opinion is, the, is, is right, whatever it may happen to be. Naturalism, uh, they believe in science and that science drives everything and that has all the answers for everything. Uh, those people are typically materialistic. Uh, they, uh, they're secular Marxists. Um, and then there's the postmodernism, which uh, uh, there's no universal means of discerning truth. So again, uh, it is what it is. You do what you want to do. Life is good. And uh, there are hybrids of those five. Now, syncretism uh, is what, as I mentioned, the sixth one come in, uh, become popular here in the U.S. And it's kind of a, a cafeteria approach whereby individuals pick what they like about all the different worldviews, and that's, what they, that's what, how they form their own worldview. So it's like believing the Bible but, not, but, but taking exception to what it says about marriage, okay? Or killing babies, whatever. So you just pick a topic. So it's, I don't believe that, so, but I do believe in God. So you, you pick and you choose. Now, uh, for those of you who would, uh, are interested in, and I want to drill down and learn a lot about uh, world views, this publication from uh, Family Research Council uh, is available to you as you're going out the door. You take a left right before you get to, to uh, Joe's office in that little foyer area out there, and we have a stack of them out there, and you're welcome to them. So uh, one per family. So there's a, a limited supply, so I uh, wouldn't want everybody in the family to take one. So if you could share one, that'd be great. So um, as previously stated, and, and um, let me run quickly through this uh, uh, little bit of information, and we'll get into our word. Uh, the, as previously stated, worldview is the, is, has been thought to be the predominant view in America, but it has uh, surveys show that it has declined significantly in recent years. Uh, in 2020, uh, it was 6% uh, of Americans held a biblical worldview, which was half what it was 25 years prior to that. Uh, in 23, survey was updated, and it was down to 4%. And um, to fortunately, uh, the, 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 even though the trend line is down, uh, if you drill down into the different details, demographic details, there is some encouraging signs. Uh, that are there uh, that um, that hopefully will be part of stemming the tide uh, a little bit, but we won't be going in that today. So there, uh, a worldview typically has seven cornerstones, and uh, bar according to George Barner, and uh, just very quickly, uh, orthodox biblical view uh, about the understanding of God. Uh, recognizing and acknowledging that all human beings are sinful by nature, uh, and then the consequences of sin, uh, and that they can only be forgiven uh, and eliminated through Jesus Christ. Uh, the entire and the, the inerrancy of the word uh, being the fourth one, uh, absolute moral truth, uh, number five, uh, and number six is the ultimate purpose of human life is to know, love, and serve God with your, all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. And then the seventh uh, cornerstone, as it were, uh, would, uh, would be success. Our success on earth is understood in the context of God's obedience to God's word and his will uh, and his thoughts and actions. So, in summary, uh, just a, 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 a truly biblical worldview is rooted in and shaped by the truth that God has revealed to humanity. Now, interestingly enough, Psalm 19 gives a similar testimony to a worldview. And, and uh, this is a massive testimony of the glory and the power and the relevance and the comprehensiveness and the and the sufficiency of God and the clarity of Scripture and contained in 14 verses in Psalm 19. It's kind of an abbreviation of Psalm 119, which has, I think, what, 176 verses or something like that. 
So um, we're going to be looking at Psalm 19 today, and at least we're going to be looking at the first six verses. And um, the psalm is divided into two distinct parts. Uh, and, the, uh, and it also uses two distinct names for God. So verses 1 through 6 present the case for the revelation of God through creation. And it refers to God in, uh, as El, or uh, Elohim, a shortened version of Elohim, uh, which is, uh, again, a, a, one of God's names. And then the verses 7 through 14 uh, speak to the revelation of God through his word. And it uses the Hebrew word for God, Yahweh, which is God's personal name. And uh, the um, and it uses it throughout those uh, eight verses, 7 through 14. So if you haven't already turned to Psalm 19, if you would do that, please. We're going to camp here for the rest of the uh, day today, not all day long, but until the end of the service. And uh, we're only going to be looking at the first six verses today, and next week we'll be looking at verses 7 through 14. So this is a two-part message, and um, so we have a lot to learn uh, in the second part. Uh, now, King David, uh, we're all somewhat familiar with King David uh, just by uh, our readings in Scripture and teachings that we may have had. But uh, He, of course, was the, under the power of the influence of the Holy Spirit. He was the author of this song. And uh, he himself is a, is a man of stark contrast. Um, he knew the humility of being a shepherd, looking after a bunch of sheep bunch of dumb old sheep. And he knew the prestige of reigning over a nation as well. He experienced glorious triumphs in his life, and he had bitter defeats. He sought after God, and yet he also suffered immense guilt and pain from immorality and from murder, such that it led to even his own sons trying to kill him, telling him to take David's life. And some of his psalms have, are psalms of great hope, and others of utter despair. But through it all, through all that, ups and downs in David's life and the challenges and the, the, the victories, he always looked to God and was assured of God's sovereignty and the sufficiency of his divine resources. So in, in this psalm that he penned, uh, he, this is the most monumental, it has been said, this is the most monumental statement ever made about the sufficiency of Scripture. Now, uh, if, you, if you've turned there in your Bibles, you may notice at the very top uh, or at the beginning of the heading of the Bible, it says, to the choir master, a psalm of David. Obviously, David wrote this uh, in a poetic or poem-type style that was to be sung. Uh, and he, um, he states that at the very beginning. Some of your Bibles, uh, depending upon what version you're looking at, uh, may also, uh, the heading might also say the works and word of God or something similar. And as we'll see, that is indeed the subject or the topic here. Um, now, as an interesting aside, maybe not be interesting to you, but I thought it was kind of interesting to me anyway, um, it occurred to me that while I was working on this message that Jesus, growing up in a Jewish household, that he would have sung the Psalms. That's what they do. They have this, this Psalm Torah. Some, some of the Psalms are part of the, quote, Torah, the readings that they do uh, periodically. And he would likely have been present when they were singing this song. Now, that's pretty wild. You think about it. The creator singing about the creation. So, anyway, I just, there's a thought that I had. I just thought it's kind of weird. But uh, Chuck would say, that's cool. Y'all know who Chuck is? You don't know who Chuck is? Later. <laughs> Last Man Standing. He's a character in Last Man Standing. Okay, let's, uh, let's read uh, the first six verses together of... Uh, Psalm 19. I'm going to be reading these from the New Living Translation. 
uh, today, it, it, it just, uh, uh, the phrasing here is, uh, out the meaning is, 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 uh, uh, is the same as any, most any other version you see, but the phrasing I thought was really good. So, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the world, throughout the earth, and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. In these opening verses, the, the, the majesty of God is revealed uh, uh, in his works and, and in his creation. Uh, how many of you have ever uh, been camping, at, uh, been, maybe been camping or, or uh, spent the night maybe in a remote cabin or, or uh, uh, on a lake or even on the ocean? Uh, or maybe as uh, Ken and Allie did, who were in the deep, darkest parts of Africa on safari or something like that. I don't know if you were in the deep, darkest parts of Africa, but I know y'all y'all were just there. But uh, if you've ever been where there's no light pollution and there's no sound pollution, and the only thing you can do that is to get miles and miles out of town and uh, the, uh, away from humanity, so to speak, but you get a totally different perspective on the creation when you and the heavens. The heavens do declare the glory of God. You just cannot escape it when you're out, whether it's thundering or whether it's stars or whether it's uh, a moonlit night or not. It just, it just, it's just strictly amazing. So if you've ever had a similar uh, experience like that, it's one of the most overpowering uh, uh, characteristics of this moment. For me, at least, it was, was which you could really see. It. And you can hear the voices of nature. That's one thing. Two, you can hear the crickets. I mean, you can really hear the crickets. Of course, somebody would say, well, uh, you know, you just turn your hearing aids up west, and, well, yeah, I'll do that too some <laughs> from time to time. So anyway, um, Whenever I read Psalm 19, I, I can't help either but imagine in, in my mind, I'm reading this, that here's this shepherd boy by the name of David. He's sleeping night after night under the stars. He's being warmed during the day by the sunshine when it's on those chilly mornings when you wake up. And this majesty is all around him, and he, it's greet, it greets him every morning when he gets up. The sun greets him every morning and every night when the stars come out, the moon sh shines. He gets to see it all over again. And imagine, if you would, how maybe whether he's reclining under the moon and the stars or being warm by the chilly days, he sees God's glory, and in those moments, he's inspired to express his thoughts and to write them down for us today. It's no wonder that David began this psalm the way he did, by describing how the heavens, the stars, our own galaxy around us, proclaim the glory of God. God made the heavens and everything in them moves according to his synchronized plan, and, and we see that in this psalm. In in, and especially in, some, in, in this opening volley in, in verse 1. In verse 2, uh, David continues, day to day, pours forth, day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. So whether it's uh, daytime or nighttime, the majesty of God works, God's works declares his creative power. Uh, as described in the Hebrew text, uh, the, the words in the Hebrew text communicate a little bit more than than we in our English words do, but it's a, it would say uh, day to day uh, they continue to speak like 
a fountain that never stops. The Hebrew word for revealing or pours forth, pours forth rather, is the, the word that con communicates a fountain that never stops or a river that, ne that runs to the sea. It never stops. Every day as man looks into the vastness, vastness of the created order, God speaks. He speaks continually. And when nighttime comes and the moon rises in the sky and the stars begin to shine, then David realizes that there are more things in heaven and on earth that declare God's glory. And he shares those things with them. Maybe he takes a moment to rest during the day from his duties and he sits back in the sunshine of the day and he takes his pens, uh, his pen out or whatever he writes with and he scribbles something down. Like, you know, like A, the heavens declare the glory of God or you know, God revealing himself for, uh, talks about the sun, which he does here in uh, verse 4. Uh, and again, before he goes to bed at night, he again takes this moment of contemplation to reflect even more. And he says, when I consider the moon and stars and the work of your hands, what your fingers have ordained. Absent that revelation, you know, one might think they're out there. David might have thought maybe he was out there all alone. But he, he knew, he experienced God. He knew God was there with him. Continuing in verses 3 and 4, David strikingly says there is no speech. There's no words, no voice, but the cry goes out through all the earth. Now, how does that happen? What's, what's he doing here? He's telling us that creation speaks, but not in an audible way. It has a message that it sends to us, and that the testimony of God comes by way of the glory of this world that he has created. And there's a voice, a voice that goes through all the earth. And there are words that go to the ends of the world. But the words are not audible. So that whether you're in Wilmington, North Carolina, or Jerusalem, Israel, or in the deepest dark jungle of Africa, you hear and you see the evidence of the testimony of God through this creation transcends ge geography, boundaries, ethnicity, everything, no matter where you're on the globe. You can look, and there's God. In the last sentence of verse 4, the, the focus changes from uh, time and space more to more general heaven and earth to the most obvious and spectacular object in them, and that is the sun. And... Um, and the last, uh, again, we're looking at the last sentence here. And, and David says, in relationship to the sun, that God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. Some translations use the term that's made a tent or a place or a tabernacle. And your version might actually translate, he has a structure for the sun. The, the point being is that the, he's made a place for the sun. The sun has a permanent, permanent dwelling place. Uh, in the skies. And he goes on in verse 5 to compare the sun to a bridegroom and an athlete. And these images are, are designed to, to use together to try and capture the idea of youthful strength. In, in the verses, David compares the radiance of the sun to the, to the man who emerges from his home on his wedding day. He's full of joy, and, and he's handsomely arrayed, uh, arrayed as he goes to his fiancée's home to claim her. And uh, as uh, we, we've been, uh, what, two or three weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, and, and there we see an example of, the, of what David would have been writing about, where the, 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 the groom emerges on his, quote, wedding day to go and retrieve his betrothed so that they can go off together, uh, as it were. He also compares um, the son to a strong man, that, you know, probably a, a well-conditioned athlete who, who runs maybe a prescribed course. Um, 
And th now these two metaphors that, that um, they actually do a good job of describing our earthly observation of the, of the brilliant sun as it rises in the east in the morning. I don't know if you are like me, but I love to, to watch the sun rise. Uh, whenever we're in places that, uh, you know, uh, you're aware that the beach or somewhere close to uh, where, where we can, where I can see the sunrise. I'm up at, whenever the sun, sun come, comes up, I'm up. You know, we vacation uh, from time to time in, in a, uh, uh, at Amelia Island in Florida. Gail and I do, and we have this friend that has a, uh, a relative has a house right on the beach on the east, on the eastern shore. And Whenever we're there, whether the sun rises at 5 a.m. in the morning or 6 or 7, whenever it is, I'm there watching the sun come up. And it's, it's just as, as, uh, as David describes here, the sun can't wait to burst forth. And that's what this, these, these two metaphors are talking about with regard to the, the groom and the athlete. They can't wait to burst forth. They can't wait to, to uh, the sun can't wait to rise. And if you see it once, it starts to creep above the horizon just a little bit. It just, you know, you, if you turn your head, it's, it's there. And uh, it's, it, it seems to be excited and just ready to burst forth for every day. It's in the horizon. And the writer reveals in verse 6 more about it's the sun and its purpose. And it tells us, too, that, that the sun is on a specific course or a track that has been ordained for it by the Creator. It rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and the psalmist points out as well that nothing can hide from the sun. Nothing can hide from the sun. Everyone can feel its heat. And uh, by the way, if you've ever, you, you wonder why it's, uh, you know, there, if you've ever wondered how cooler is it in the shade? It's 20 degrees cooler in the shade than it is in the sunshine. <laughs> That's a fact that you can carry with you that nobody really cares about. So, uh, made me lose my point there. Uh, while at the uh, time this psalm was written, um, it was presumed the sun appeared in the east and rose uh, the, and, uh, and stayed in one place and the earth moved around it actually didn't rise. It appeared that everything revolved around the sun. And that's not really the case. That's not how it works. And, uh, but having said that, the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, the words that are inspired there don't limit us to that, uh, to that, the, the sun being the one that's moving as opposed to uh, uh, the earth. The point of verses 5 and 6 um, is that God's glory is as obvious as the most visible and powerful object in God's creation, that is the sun. His, he is, um, it is, God's glory is as obvious as the most visible and powerful object in God's creation, and that's the sun. We can never escape God's presence wherever we go. So let me just kind of summarize these, these passages for you and uh, try to wrap up a little bit here. Uh, the only way we could ever know God is if God reveals himself to us. That's the only way we can know God is if he reveals himself to us, and he has done that. He has done it in two ways, and that is through his creation, and we've talked about that in these few moments uh, that, that uh, have, in the last 10 or 15 minutes, we've talked about that creation. And um, he's also revealed himself through his word, the, the Holy Scripture. And uh, we'll be looking at that next week. And um, so, but I'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, first of all, in his creation, Psalm 19 begins, the heavens are telling us the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day, pours forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge. What the psalmist is saying is you can see God revealed in the universe, universe and creation. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, most of you are familiar with this verse, 
it says, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. And through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. So the very universe itself reveals something of God's nature. In, in nature, we see God is intelligent. We see his power in nature. We see it's a, he's complex. He's highly organized. He's, he loves beauty. He loves righteousness. He disdains sin. There are many elements of the nature of God that are manifest in creation. Uh, even things that are, that are true about him morally are obvious. Romans 2 tells us that, that the law of God's written in the human heart. And, and we see that in these verses in Psalm 19 as well. Every, every human being has a sense of right and wrong, and that's a God's given, a God-given reflection of being created in his image. We can know that God exists by the creation around us and in our own lives to our own moral sense. And we can, as such, we can know enough about God, the Bible says, to be judged. God reveals himself to us in our sinful nature, and we still have to stand for those sins. It's not enough to know there's a God. We have to know God. Um, we have to go beyond the message of, of, of the natural world, and that is in the Word. Uh, scripture alone is, uh, informs us of God's will for us, his plan for redemption, and his purposes in salvation. And that is what we'll be talking about next week. Uh, and we'll look at that in more detail. Now, <clears throat> before we uh, close out today, uh, uh, earlier I, I shared with you the kind of the four goals that I had for these, uh, these two weeks uh, of uh, this message today and next week, and that uh, being the importance of having a biblical worldview, uh, the exploring what a biblical worldview looks like, uh, and then uh, looking at what the church is doing or can do uh, to enhance one's existing worldview and what you individually can do to educate yourself and solidify the foundational beliefs in the Word of God, and we're going to be talking about that next week. Many of you are aware that the church has been working, the, the elders have been working on a strategic plan for our church, uh, and um, you know, we've, uh, we are uh, razor focused on what the, uh, the mission of the church is, and we're going to be talking about more that more next week uh, in the message uh, that there. And, uh, and as we look at verses 7 through 14. And uh, so, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for uh, the few moments we've had to, together today to uh, look at your word, to uh, uh, ex reflect upon the, uh, how the, the church, uh, Big C, how the church has neglected its mission that was given to us and how, what we individually uh, can do and what we as a church uh, can do. We look briefly at that in, in some small part. Um, and uh, I pray, Lord, that in these uh, days ahead that uh, we would be, uh, that we would look especially uh, at our own hearts and our own lives and how um, we uh, can better serve you more faithfully and how we can um, truly reflect a biblical worldview and be a part of, this, of the mission, uh, be an active participant in the mission that you've called us to, to make disciples uh, and to teach them all that you have taught us through your word. Father, we thank you that you're faithful uh, and holy God. Uh, we look forward to uh, the days ahead and we look forward to that day when we'll spend eternity with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.